Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. Welcome to our webinar, COVID-19 for Transplant Recipients, brought to you jointly by BC Transplant and the Transplant Research Foundation of BC. Uh, I'm Tina Robinson, that you're hearing, Manager of Communications and Community Relations with BC Transplant. Uh, before we get started, I would like to go over just a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. Uh, I know many of you have already submitted questions, uh, which we've gone through. Um, but uh, as we move through um, the webinar, you've joined by default with your audio and video muted. Uh, you'll be able to see our presenters when they speak. Uh, for those of you joining on your computer, you can submit text questions to the presenters by typing them into the questions pane found in the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of the meeting window. We've turned off the chat function just to make it easier for us to monitor the questions panel. Uh, you can send in your questions anytime during the presentation. We'll collect these and try our best to address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Uh, in order to protect your privacy when you ask a question, please don't use your name or provide any other personal identifying information. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available online through BC Transplant and the Transplant Research Foundation. So I'd like to introduce you to um, Christy Caldwell, who's our moderator for this webinar. She's the Senior Advisor for Transplant Research Advocacy at the Transplant Research Foundation of BC. So I'll turn it over to Christy now. Thank you, Tina. And hello to everyone joining us today. The BC Transplant and the Transplant Research Foundation of BC are pleased to partner to bring you this webinar on COVID and transplantation. We are excited to have three panelists today who will each speak on a different aspect of today's webinar. Dr. James Land is an assistant professor at the University of British Columbia, a transplant nephrologist at Vancouver General Hospital, and the director of Immunology Laboratory in BC. He recently received a grant from BCHRI and TRFBC to examine organ transplant recipients' immune response to COVID-19. He anticipates this work will provide data that can help physicians tailor immunosuppression in patients exposed to COVID-19. Dr. Alyssa Wright is a clinical associate professor at the University of British Columbia within the Division of Infectious Disease. Her clinical responsibilities include the care of pre and post transplant patients at Vancouver General Hospital and St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver. She is a consultant for BT Transplant on infectious disease issues in organ donors. Dr. Robert Levy is the Medical Director of the BC Lung Transplant Program and Associate Director of the Pulmonary Hypertension Program at Vancouver General Hospital. He is currently a Professor of Medicine at the University of British Columbia. We also have a special guest panelist to start us off today. Dr. Sean Keenan is the Provincial Medical Director for Donation Services with BC Transplant. He's going to get us started with a brief overview of organ donation and transplant during the COVID-19 pandemic. So Sean, we'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Christy, and good afternoon, everyone. So organ donation and transplant during this pandemic has been significantly affected, as I think most people are aware. Um, a lot of discussion, both provincially and nationally, has been ongoing during this time to try to reach some sort of consensus approach to things, and information keeps changing. Um, uh, what way things initially started that we, while we kept transplant open um, for all group and all organ groups to some extent initially there was a very a significant decrease and our decision really making was uh, made on uh, was based on two factors one is just capacity at the transplant hospitals um, as you can know that there was a concern that we would see a significant surge uh, and we did see a, a large number of patients with COVID-19 come into the hospitals and the ICUs. Fortunately, nothing like we're seeing in other places, but we just didn't know initially. And so there's a lot of concerns that there would not be the capacity to recover patients after um, uh, transplantation. And so that was one limiting factor that was reassessed throughout. The second was the known risk to anybody who's immune compromised and bringing people in for transplant during this time and depending upon the volume of COVID in the transplant hospitals, uh, that was obviously a concern. And as I mentioned previously, there were national uh, meetings, uh, there were TCONs uh, twice a week uh, through Canadian Blood Services, uh, donation and transplant and infectious disease specialists. 
and consensus statements that sort of came out of this. So I just want to reassure you, this was something that was broadly discussed. Um, things have improved somewhat uh, since that time. We, fortunately, the, uh, uh, the surge was not that bad. Now that things have become much better. And so um, transplant is gradually moving back towards normal, but we're not at similar volumes. Living donation was a, a suspe a suspended pretty much from March right through to mid-May, but is now back in place. Um, uh, kidney transplants are starting to get back, are also into the same rate, um, but they were significantly restricted um, uh, early on. And other organs as well, there was very much case-by-case -case, uh, approach. Um, during this time, all donors uh, were screened and continue to be screened for COVID-19 with uh, swabs and, and lung aspirates, as well as all cases are discussed um, with our infectious disease uh, uh, specialists, uh, um, specifically Dr. Wright. Right, it's been involved in pretty much all the cases. And that's sort of a quick summary. There was a definitely big dip right from you know, March through till uh, last month um, when we started to see some more recovery and we'll just really have to see how it goes. One thing is that we've had pretty steady referrals. We thought we'd see a drop in that, but our referral numbers still seem to be good. It's just we weren't able to do as many cases. So that's uh, really the main things I wanted to cover right now, uh, Christy. Thank you, Sean. Um, perhaps now we will hear from the rest of the panelists, starting with Dr. Lin. Thank you, Christy. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to the session today. Uh, I'm a kidney transplant nephrologist, and so for my part of the talk, I thought I would provide some data on how has COVID-19 impacted kidney transplant patients. And then the second part, I would discuss um, the ongoing research that we're doing to study COVID-19 in transplant recipients. So the million dollar question here is, how does COVID-19 affect kidney tran or transplant patients in general because of the requirement to take immunosuppressant? So if you're a patient awaiting to get a, a transplant, you might ask yourself, well, is it better if I get a transplant now or it's deferred? Because if I get a transplant, I need to go on immunosuppressant. And if I get an infection from COVID-19, am I gonna be worse off? If you're a patient who's already had a, a, a transplant, you might ask yourself again, if I get COVID-19, am I gonna fare worse than a general person who is non-immunosuppressant? And that data is very difficult to, to get. And, and it's an ongoing debate about how does immunosuppression affect transplant patients? So to give you an idea, um, I have presented this table over here to give you an example. So in the left column, you see British Columbians. Currently, there is 5.1 million uh, people that live in BC. Amongst those people, the 5, 5 million uh, residents here, about 3.9% have been tested for COVID-19 because of their symptoms. And out of those tested, actually only 1.5% are positive for COVID-19. And out of the people who are positive for COVID-19, um, the death rate so far is 6%. So that's kind of in the general population. I also have data on kidney transplant patients in BC. So in comparison, there's about uh, 3,700 uh, patients who have received a kidney transplant in BC so far in the province. Overall, about 5% have of them have been tested for COVID because of their symptoms. That is a little bit higher than the general population. And that's partially because when you're a transplant patient, we as physicians tend to pay more attention to them and also tend to test more. So that's not surprising to me. And overall among those patients who have the symptoms have been tested, 2% of them um, are positive for COVID-19. And you can see that that's so far only been four patients out of the entire um, uh, 3,700 patients in the province with a kidney transplant. So th those numbers are fairly comparable to just the general population in BC. Um, when you look at the death rate, it looks very scary. It looks like there's about half of people, two out of four people have died in those who are affected with COVID-19. But I think even to someone who doesn't study epidemiology, you can understand when your number is very small, it can really look exaggerated you know, out of four people, two people die, that, that's 50%. But when you have more cases, that may not be the case. So that's kind of an overview about what's happened in BC so far. Um, if you ask me how many transplant patients overall have, received, have, have been positive for COVID-19, there's four kidney transplant patients, two extra renal patients. So um, 
uh, six so far. And, and you see the mortality right there. Next slide, please. Um, for this slide, I want to acknowledge Dr. Um, Davide Chinna, who pulled the, the data for me. And this is combining all the reports that have been published on mortality or death in kidney uh, transplant patients with COVID-19 in the world. So on the left, you can see we pull data from seven different publications, and they're from countries in USA, Italy, China, and Spain. And overall, at the time when we pull this data, there's over, over, over about 100 patients uh, reported with COVID-19. And you can see on the far right, about 20% of patients have died. Now, it's very easy to make this inference to say, well, that sounds very high because the mortality due to COVID-19 in Canada is, about, is around 8%. But as most of you can appreciate, patients that have organ failure, um, that need kidney transplant or other organ transplants, they tend to have much more comorbid conditions. They tend to have diabetes, they tend to be older, and much more health issues compared to the general population. So it's not really a fair comparison. And so for that reason, it's been very difficult to answer the question, is it just that transplant patients do worse because they have multiple other conditions that make them more susceptible to, to death? Or is it because they're on immunosuppression? Next slide, please. When we look at how have physicians managed immunosuppression in patients with a transplant that contracted COVID, it's been basically quite random. There are 20% of the people uh, physicians that don't change their immunosuppressive management. And there is about um, a great majority of them will reduce the immunosuppression intensity somewhat. And if you're a transplant patient, you recognize these medication names, mecafenolin, azathioprine, they're what we call anti-metabolite. And there's about 77% of physicians that will actually discontinue it or hold it. Um, there's about a quarter of physicians that will go the other way. They will hold your tacrolimus or cyclosporin. And um, most physicians, they don't touch steroids, so only 6% of physicians reduce or discontinue steroids. So it's been a mixed bag of uh, approach to how physicians cater immunosuppressant, mainly because most physicians, they really don't know what to do. And you might ask yourself, well, why is that the case here? Intuitively, when someone has infection, you might imagine that it's a good idea to cut down the immunosuppressant because that boosts up your immunity, one can fight infection better. However, when you read what's out there in the literature, um, you might discover that the thing that kills patients uh, when they get COVID-19 is the fact that they develop this hyperactive immune overdrive called cytokine storm. And I think that's been reported in, in the general pub publications that this phenomenon is really what um, caused lung injury and multi-system organ failure and patients eventually die from that. And that's the interesting part about COVID-19 because it kind of stimulates the immune system to become overactive and that's what drives death. So in that way, when you think about it, perhaps one may not want to discontinue all immunosuppressant because you may actually make that, that, that condition even worse by allowing the immunity to go into overdrive. Because of this uh, dilemma, that's why physicians tend to uh, not know what to do at the present time. Go into the next slide, please. So um, this forms the basis for the research um, that was found, funded by BCHRI and TRFBC. Um, I'm the principal investigator. And what we want to do is to try to study this problem through a biological mechanism. And um, you see the timeline there I drew out for you. Um, when one gets an infection, typically what happens is that, um, Christy, can you just click on the uh, animation? that you have um, cells and think of these cells as soldiers that come and they fight the infection. Okay, so these are cells that we call T, T lymphocytes. So they come, they see the infection and they try to fight it off. But in the process of doing that, they send up these molecules called cytokines. And these cytokines are essentially mess uh, alert messages that tell the other troops to come on and to fight the infection even more. And then eventually those cytokines lead to the next layer of troops that come to fight infection. And that's how you develop the antibodies. So in a typical infection, you would expect these things to go right. You contain the infection and then the infection dies. However, the problem with COVID is that 
what you see in red, the cytokine, sometimes the cytokine process becomes overactive. So we can imagine that your system, immune system goes into an overdrive. Beyond killing infection, it begins to harm the body. And that's what's been lethal for many patients who die from this infection. And the other thing is that when you talk about the recruitment of cells to fight infection, this could be impaired because someone's on immunosuppressant. So right now the dilemma is, well, should we relax immunosuppressant or should we keep it or intensify it if someone is beginning to show evidence they're going to go into hyperimmune uh, system overdrive? And that forms the basis for a study. Uh, next slide, please. What we intend to do is, uh, next slide, is that we're going to collect these um, markers through blood tests. There are three different blood tests that we do for transplant patients and the general population of patients at a time when they have the infection, one week later and three weeks later. What we hope to do is to study why is the immune system behaving differently in the transplant patient compared to someone non-immunosuppressant. And if it does, how does it impact their outcomes that you see on the right? And what we hope to get out of this study is that we hope to be able to tailor our immunosuppressant based on these three different tests that we're going to do so that we can inform physicians whether they should add on more or relax their immunosuppressant in someone who's got the active infection. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. So thanks. Um, uh, it's my turn to talk and I was asked to speak about some of the questions that were sent in, particularly around risk of COVID-19 and things people can do to prevent it, particularly if you are a transplant patient. So let me just say that this is a very difficult area to give black and white yes or no answers are on, partly because there's still a lot we don't know about COVID and we don't have any therapies or vaccines. Um, however, I'll go through a couple of uh, charts that have been developed to look at different risks in different settings. And hopefully by that, you can get some principles that you can use to assess your own risk of getting COVID and maybe look at ways you can change or modify your risk or maybe not do the activity at all. So the first one that I've put up here is a chart that was uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And it was meant as an advisory for physicians on how to counsel patients about whether or not they should return to work. Um, and it was developed for patients who are higher risk, not necessarily transplant patients, but I also think it would be applicable to this patient population. So the first thing that you will see on this chart is that up the uh, what we call the y axis or this side on the on the left, you'll see there is an increasing risk of being at work and being in contact with someone who's uh, coronavirus or COVID positive. And so you can see it goes from low at the bottom to high, which means lots of contact with people with COVID-19. And on what is we would call the x-axis or running along here on the top is the person's individual risk of actually dying or being very sick from COVID-19. You could put either in there and you could see it goes from low so that someone who's younger age or maybe doesn't have some comorbidities, meaning other medical conditions that would put them at higher risk to high, which is someone who is older age or maybe slightly younger and has lots of other medical conditions, including transplant. And you can see that depending on what the risk is of contacting someone with, uh, being in contact with someone specifically who is COVID positive and how, uh, how many comorbidities you have or what your age is, your risk could be anything from fairly low where you would be instructed like everyone else to wear a mask when you were outside the home or around people and could not physically distance, uh, wash your hands frequently and use any other measures that your workplace put into um, play. For example, some workplaces have put up barriers to prevent people from being too close together or they limit the number of people who are actually physically in a building at the same time. 
Um, however, if you were uh, in the yellow area, you would uh, be at higher risk of either being in contact with someone or you're at higher risk of having complications from COVID. You would really want to examine whether there was anything further you could do at work to consider uh, reducing or to be able to get your risk down. And if you were at very highest risk, you might not want to go to work at all. Next slide. Uh, this is another similar, again, sort of chart, uh, slightly different. This one was actually put out uh, by uh, BC CDC and the government of BC. And this would be applicable to non-work situations where they would look here on the left at the contact intensity, which is the number of people that you are um, in contact with for either a short amount of time, which is low at the bottom, to a high amount of time or prolonged contact. And then along the bottom, running along the bottom, is the number of contacts from low to high over here on the right. And so you can see that uh, the risk of actually contacting COVID would go up so that if you were in contact with lots of people intensely on a close basis for a very prolonged period of time, you would be at risk of COVID. And so I think overall what I hope you get a sense from these two charts is that the risk of COVID varies by how active COVID is in the community and how um, likely you are to contact someone with COVID, how long you're in contact with different people and how many people you're in contact with, and whether there's anything you can do to modify it um, to reduce your risk. And so for things like getting your hair cut or going to work, sometimes it's, it's not a yes or no answer that any one person can give you. It's going to depend on what your risk factors are for a severe infection and whether there's anything you can do to modify it. So for example, going for a haircut in the middle of the day when there are lots of people there and nobody's wearing a mask would be higher risk then if there was not a lot of COVID in your community and you went early in the day and you were the only person who was there and the two of you were wearing masks. So you can see that the risk of those two situations would be different. Next slide, please. And I think overall, I know this has been said in the news multiple times, but really even uh, for transplant patients, I strongly encourage you to follow what has been advocated by BC CDC and public health. And the best measures are staying two meters apart if possible, frequent hand washing, and then um, wearing a mask if you're in a location where you cannot physically distance. The other thing that's important is to stay home if you have symptoms or you think you're sick um, because uh, you would, we don't want to pass it on to other people. And um, if you think you need to, to come into hospital and you're sick, call the transplant clinic. Next slide. Um, so the other thing that is, uh, was, I was asked to address is about vaccines, because I understand there's a lot of uh, questions about vaccines. And I know this is an area of interest in the news. Um, and so I cannot give you any specifics at present about what vaccine will be available and whether transplant patients are able to get that vaccine. But I did want to give you a sense of the number of vaccines that are being developed. So currently there are six different types of vaccines that these are different ways that you can actually stimulate someone's immune system to develop a response to an infection. They range from everything from like pieces of DNA or little pieces of RNA to um, the actual virus itself in a live form where it's kind of weakened enough that you would develop immunity but not strong enough that it would make you sick. And what you can see is that out of all of these different vaccines, some of them are similar to vaccines that we have already, like the hepatitis A vaccine or the common flu vaccine, whereas some of them are pretty novel and they're not vaccines that, are, there are no examples of vaccines that we currently have available uh, that would fit into this category. And so depending on which vaccine actually works and what category they fall into, transplant patients may or may not be able to get vaccinated when one is developed. And so um, I would, 
uh, encourage everyone to keep following what's being developed, but ultimately when the time comes, it's going to be a matter of asking your transplant physicians whether there is a vaccine that you are eligible, because we know as transplant patients that some vaccines are acceptable if they're inactive or dead vaccines, and other vaccines you cannot get, like those ones that are based on live viruses. So I'll stop there. Next slide. Hi, my name is Bob Levy. I'm a lung specialist at Vancouver General and work with the lung transplant team. Um, just do a ch sound check. We're okay on the sound? Excellent. Great. I've been asked to talk about some of the practical aspects of how patients who need follow-up are being seen currently in the clinic once they're discharged from the hospital. I'm going to be talking specifically about the lung transplant program I will tell you that the approach in lung transplant is similar to the other solid organ transplant programs. I imagine most of you have had, we'll just go back for a sec. Most of you have had virtual visits um, over the phone or over the computer. So what is virtual health? So we hear a lot about that in the news right now. And so virtual health really means any form of communication, which is not face to face. It could be over a computer, a tablet, a telephone. Um, so it's a very generic term. Um, why have we converted largely to virtual health, not just in transplant, but in patient encounters in general? Well, it's really around safety to minimize uh, the need for patients to travel, to be in public spaces, uh, to move through elevators in the ambulatory care centers, to sit in waiting rooms. So it's really to enhance safety. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So. This is uh, really relating to the lung transplant program. As I said, it's similar for the others. Um, so there is quite a bit of description in the literature about how virtual health would work for many conditions, especially chronic conditions uh, between healthcare uh, providers and patients. But all the literature and all we know about it is really uh, in the situation where we're trying to make uh, a patient more a more friendly sort of visit so patients don't have to travel they don't have to have the expenses and the like but there's very little information and data about what happens if you have no choice so it's wartime all of a sudden everything changes and that's what happened uh in our transplant programs over the course of about two weeks uh there was an edict we were not going to be seeing patients face to face unless absolutely necessary. So we really didn't know how to do this. And uh, we all sort of felt our way through. And many of you patients were extremely helpful in um, allowing us to figure out how to do this the best. So for instance, in the lung transplant program, prior to March uh, and the onset of the COVID epidemic, less than 5% of our patient interactions with providers were via virtual health. And we were all using uh, a setup called Movi. And some of you who might have used this before knew if you were living in a rural area that we would make you go to a hospital and uh, use a very structured, formal setup. Worked very effectively, but obviously not a good idea for trying to minimize patient uh, movement through the healthcare system. Um, at this point, most of our programs have converted to more than 90% of patients coming to the clinic um, by a virtual mechanism. So all the programs trialed various uh, different platforms um, where most of us have landed on a platform called doxy.me. You've probably been getting emails about this and how to use it. Uh, we've also used Zoom, which is the platform we, we're using now. And once again, the old system, the provincial system of Movi is uh, not something that we've carried on because of the need of attending a healthcare facility. About 75% of our encounters have been successfully done over the computer or uh, with a video link. About 25% have done by uh, telephone. Next slide, please. So uh, essentially what happens, and there's a picture of a healthcare provider, in this case, a pharmacist talking to a patient who's actually one of our clinic nurses. Some of you may have uh, uh, mentioned. So uh, the pa uh, patient and family get a link come onto the computer, sit in a waiting room, just like you would if you're in a physical clinic, and um, will be uh, brought into the encounter. So previously, under the column of in-person clinic visits, patients would generally have to arrive very early to get their blood tests done uh, before they took their immunosuppressive medications. They'd arrive 
in the case of the Vancouver General Hospital, the Diamond Healthcare Center, they get their pre clinic workup, then they uh, go wandering around getting x-rays or electrocardiograms or breathing tests or whatever they would need. They then sit in the waiting room, get uh, called in to see the nurse, get called in to see the pharmacist, and then see the physician. And often this would be, uh, as you know, a two to three hour uh, process or even longer on some occasions. So what's happening with the virtual uh, clinic visits, again, similar in all the programs, uh, we try and organize necessary blood work, x-rays, whatever has to be done uh, local to, to the patient in, in the hospital closest to them or in a blood lab. And they would then be contacted uh, sometimes by Allied Health even before they had to come to the clinic. On the day of the clinic, um, the, they get uh, a call from the nurse who goes through checking the medications and highlighting any particular problems and then uh, put into the waiting room. Uh, you can go around and do whatever you want, uh, what, waiting for the uh, connection, maybe see by Allied Health, which is a pharmacist or a dietitian, and the physician assessment. So that's the way the clinics have flowed. Uh, I would mention that, uh, for instance, in the lung transplant clinic, uh, prior to COVID and seeing patients face-to-face, -face, we were seeing in the range of 10 to 12 patients per day in the uh, post-transplant clinic. We're currently seeing about 10 to 12 patients per day. So uh, in terms of the function of the clinic, uh, it takes about as much time to do virtual health as it does for the face-to-face uh, -face visits. Um, so uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, we did track results quite uh, carefully at surveys going out both to patients as well as families and the healthcare providers. In general, the physicians were satisfied or very satisfied with the visit in more than 90% of cases. And what they meant by satisfied or very satisfied is they accomplished what needed to be accomplished in the patient encounter. Patients reported virtual care was as good or better than usual care in person 91% of the time. So uh, from their perspective, they felt that they have, had met the objectives of the, uh, the visit. Not surprisingly, uh, the out-of-pocket savings per patient were very substantial. Uh, many of our patients, we cover all of British Columbia and, uh, and Yukon uh, through one clinic in Vancouver. Kidney clinics are a bit different because there are regional clinics, but for liver, heart, and uh, lung, uh, they would generally have to come to Vancouver for the visit. So very substantial savings, direct and indirect costs, and obviously uh, substantial time savings for patients coming from rural areas uh, to get to Vancouver. Technical difficulties prevented uh, the interaction in only 2.5% of uh, visits. Although, as I mentioned, about 25% did have to get uh, conducted by phone rather than a video contact. Um, I'm just going to mention a couple of the opportunities that, that we see with virtual health. Um, it's sort of been tossed back in our lap saying, well, if you can do virtual visits, why don't we always do virtual visits? And the reality is a lot of the virtual visits that we were doing were to temporize until it was safe to bring patients to the clinic. So not all patients should be having uh, virtual visits indefinitely in the future. In terms of the advantages, we talked about the out-of-pocket costs and expenses for patients, de uh, the decrease in time commitment. Uh, it's nice because we can have asynchronous uh, visits. So sometimes if we want the dietitian to speak to the patient, that can be arranged. Not necessarily at, has to be at the same time as a physician visit. And um, it really gives improved access to tertiary care uh, for patients who are in more remote or rural locations. <clears throat> there are a couple of obstacles we've all identified. Number one, technology requirements for patients and clinics. Um, almost everyone can do a phone visit, but sometimes we really ni nice to have the, uh, the visual component. Sometimes there are technology barriers that prevent uh, us from having a completely satisfying uh, encounter. Um, in a sense, we're very reliant on the patient uh, uh, being comfortable with self-reporting of their symptoms and uh, any health concerns they may be having, which sometimes is easier in a face-to-face -face visit. Um, probably the most important thing we've learned about virtual health is the absolute importance moving forward, identifying which patients and in which situations virtual health visits are 
can replace a face-to-face -face visit uh, and it's a satisfactory interaction for both. Interestingly, a number of the patients um, who, who did find they, they were not happy with the visits, uh, they felt that they, they'd lost a social interaction and that was a bit of a surprise to us. I never imagined patients would like sitting in the waiting room for two or three hours, but I, I guess it, it, it is a social interaction. So uh, I'm gonna stop there. Um, I would like uh, just to uh, thank all the, the allied health and the physicians and the patients and the families who have helped us learn how to do this at uh, very short notice. You can go to the next slide. I, I think um, I'm supposed to answer a couple of these. Yes, actually, Bob, we have, or, or, <laughs> sorry, Dr. Levy, we actually had a couple additional questions we were hoping you might be able to touch on, mainly about attending medical appointments that have been put on hold, and what advice would you have for receiving additional health services that have not been deemed perhaps essential um, regarding the dentist, massage therapy? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I, I think uh, we've probably covered uh, the answer is mostly, if I haven't had a clinic visit over the last few months, what should I expect in general for medical follow-up? Um, and so your team will determine if uh, a virtual visit is satisfactory for your encounter. Okay. <laughs> no, that's perfect. Is there any suggestions you have around receiving additional health services? Um, I know a lot of our um, listeners were wondering about things such as the dentist and receiving physiotherapy and massage now that things are starting to open up more. Yeah, and, and I think I'd reflect back, uh, back to Dr. Wright's discussion, and it depends on, on if these are essential uh, interactions or they're uh, non-essential interactions. Um, when uh, the lung transplant patients talk to me, uh, I have pointed out that there are no specific recommendations for patients who are transplanted and immunosuppressed. Uh, my advice generally is to go to BC Transplant, link to the BC Center for Disease Control, look at the recommendations that are up there uh, from the provincial health officers, and go on the conservative side of that. Um, if I was an immunosuppressed patient right now, in view of everything we know, I'd be very comfortable going out to a park, going for a walk, uh, uh, interacting in that sort of fashion. I know the restaurants are opening and the pubs are opening and maybe technically uh, the distancing is adequate. If it was me or a family member, I would still be being very conservative about being on public transport in, uh, in restaurants, in movie theaters and the like. So um, we have very little evidence on that. If you have a dental visit that is an essential visit, I think that should be done. Um, if um, if it's a more elective activity, I would be on the cautious side. I don't know if any of my colleagues have further advice beyond that. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Levy. Um, and thank you to all the other panelists and your excellent presentations or presentations. Sorry, we will now move on to our question and answers. Uh, so thank you again to everyone who submitted questions. We received many questions, which demonstrates just how much interest there is in this topic. So please note that your exact question may not be able to be answered directly, and we will be unable to provide medical, medical advice for specific issues. So in order to address as many questions as possible, we have reviewed all of the questions that have been submitted, and we'll answer those of a similar nature collectively. Thank you again for your understanding if you do not hear your questions specifically mentioned. So perhaps we will start with Dr. Wright um, with the question regarding recipients and other comorbidities. So for patients who do have other comorbidities, such as diabetes, lung disease, high blood pressure, does this increase their risk and what other precautions would you recommend? So for people who do have other comorbidities? Yes. Uh, so I think I, I would reference back to my talk. So we know things that put patients at risk of more severe COVID or from dying from COVID include older age and medical comorbidities. I don't think, as Dr. Land mentioned, that we know uh, how these function together in terms of immunosuppression. I would anticipate theoretically that because these comorbidities increase the risk in the general population, that they would put transplant patients at uh, increased risk as well. 
I do not know how they interact with immunosuppression. And then in terms of minimizing risk, if you are a transplant patient who is older or if you're a transplant patient who is, has multiple comorbidities, I would go back to the principles that I talked about in terms of uh, how active COVID is in your community, how, how many contacts you are gonna be in touch with and for how long. And I would try if I was on the higher end of the spectrum to do as much minimization as possible. And I would agree with Dr. Levy about, in that case, I would be more conservative. Great, thank you, Dr. Wright. And we have a question for Dr. Lan um, regarding research. Could research into COVID-19 and transplant patients potentially lead to a better understanding of how our immune system functions with new knowledge created related to rejection, illness, and drug responses? Yes, um, I, I do think so. I think when we talk about the immune system, um, it's not black and white. You know, a lot of people refer to immune system as uh, if it's a good immune system, it's very active. And obviously through COVID example, that's not true. There is a good part of the immune system and there's the ugly part of the immune system. And what we don't know right now is how does an infection like COVID, um, what, what factors drive it towards the good or the bad? And what we don't know as well too is how can we use, leverage the immunosuppressants that we have in our toolbox to drive it towards the good versus the bad. If you read what's in the news right now, many of the drugs that are being shown to be promising in treating COVID, even in the general population patients, they're immunosuppressants. You know, they're suppressing the immune system in some fashion. So what we need to understand through this research is how do we uh, which types of immune system become overactive and how can we use our drugs to control it? Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Levy, we have one for you. So in the event of the second wave, how are transplant programs preparing and is there anything patients can do to prepare? Of course, knowing that we can't predict the future, but nevertheless. Oh, you're on mute, Dr. Levy. That's a great question. And I would say that um, uh, we will know a lot more about a second wave going forward than we knew about the first wave. Although um, all of us talked about pandemic planning, uh, we had no practical experience. And actually uh, there's a lot of work going on in the health regions looking at uh, person power planning, both for physicians, allied health, uh, we have a much better handle on uh, how patients should be segregated when they come into the hospital, if they have COVID or if they're uh, if suspected of having COVID or if they're in for a, another health issue. And so, uh, as you know, we, we, we have a whole additional hospital in the convention center right now, which fortunately we did not have to utilize. But uh, I think our planning is going to be um, much easier moving forward. Uh, we know how to deploy uh, healthcare staff. We know how to isolate patients. And these are all protocols we didn't have. So uh, a second wave, it seems less likely that we're gonna get the big peak that people have talked about in BC. We'll probably continue to fizzle along with uh, little outbreaks here and there, uh, as long as we keep the border closed. I guess we're supposed to keep this apolitical, but, um, um, I, I think uh, we're going to be much better prepared moving forward uh, to, to handle the issue. I guess the real challenge will be if we do acknowledge the fact that we're not going to 100% eradicate COVID in, in our communities, which is probably true, um, then uh, how should we be managing a low level of COVID and continuing to be able to open up and uh, uh, improve access to facilities everywhere. Great, thank you. Now we have some questions that directed at the entire panel. So whoever feels most comfortable answering or if two or three of you want to offer your insight. Um, so we received a lot of questions around travel. So what are your thoughts around provincial travel and travel within Canada? And also, are there any other considerations around car versus air travel? Anybody would like to answer that, hopefully? Have some thoughts on that? 
So I can definitely start with that question. Um, it's a great one. I would say from the perspective of transplant and travel that, um, again, it goes back to the principles of sort of what is the purpose of the travel and how ex uh, essential is it? So are you traveling to come to a medical appointment here in Vancouver that you can only get here versus, um, you know, something that may be uh, less essential. I think it depends on the activity of COVID where you are and also the activity of COVID in the place that you're going to because we are all supposed to be good stewards and be mindful that when we travel to somewhere else, certainly we could take COVID with us to that community as well. Um, I think Currently, the rate in BC is low, and that um, if depending on where it was, that going somewhere would not be unreasonable. I, I wonder about uh, longer travel out, uh, outside of our province across Canada, because we know there are areas where this is more active. And certainly, I would be conservative as a transplant patient and not want to go there. Um, and I think the more factors in your environment that you can control, so for example, if you're driving in your own car versus flying, um, there are certain things uh, that you will not be able to mitigate when you're flying versus driving. For example, they are talking about um, having three people to a seat where uh, physical distancing may not be possible. And so I think all of those factors should be considered. Um, along with what the purpose of the travel is and where you will be staying at the other end and what the activity of COVID is there uh, before people make or when people make plans. Great, thank you. Um, we are staying kind of on my, that topic. We have a lot of questions regarding summer activities. Is it safe to go camping and use public spaces such as restrooms, hotels, and swimming pools? And this is open to any of you, perhaps Bob and Jane, you might want to speak up uh, or Lisa. Sure, I, I'll jump in on this one. I think this, again, falls in a similar line of question. And I, I, I'm seeing these questions come through to the uh, Q&A session as well, too. There's a lot of similar nature questions being asked. And I think it's probably frustrating that we're not given clear black and white answers. Yes, it's okay to do that. Or no, it's not okay to do that. And that's because the COVID infection is so dynamic. You know, there are clear hotspots where we know there's an outbreak somewhere and common sense tells us not to go there. But then that, that changes over time. So from my perspective, I would always apply what Dr. Wright has said. You know, if I want to go somewhere, I would apply a risk versus benefit ratio. It's like, what do I hope to accomplish through this visit? And what's the risk of going out there? And, and then I can infer whether it makes sense for me to go there. And that, that threshold, in my opinion, is very different for everybody. Um, if it's imperative for your mental health to go out somewhere to take a walk or do these things, then you know what? That, that's a lot of benefit versus someone that perhaps is perfectly fine staying at home for a whole week and not to, not to go somewhere. So I think that, that it's more about the approach that we take uh, for these recommendations rather than strictly saying, yes, it's okay to do this or not. Um, for instance, myself, I haven't been to see a dentist for over a year now because of COVID. It's because I haven't had any dental issues, so I don't really need to go somewhere that I don't need to. And, but one day if I was having some dental issues, the risk versus benefit calculation changes, then yeah, then I'm gonna see care because I'm having an active infection perhaps I need to get unlooked at. So that's kind of how I approach these kind of things. Um, I don't know, Bob, if you, have any wisdom that you would like to add to this or, or Alyssa? Um, I, I guess this is more a chat, like none of these are really uh, situations that, that we have firm answers on, as you say. I'm a bit of a chicken. <laughs> I like being in British Columbia. I'm happy to stay pretty close to home. Um, we are all going to work, working in a safe environment in the hospital. So we are having a lot of social interaction. I think it's been very challenging for especially transplant patients who have been really self-isolating in a terrific way. 
In fact, I think uh, one of the reasons we haven't seen a huge problem in transplant patients is uh, people are appropriately being super cautious and uh, have been self-isolating and protecting themselves and others around them more so than the general population. Um, I personally would not be getting on an airplane now to go to a meeting in Eastern Canada. Um, uh, I'm quite happy driving around in my car. Um, I don't think I need a mask driving around in my car. Uh, seems like a lot of uh, a lot of people are doing that. But um, I think, uh, and it came up before. It's a matter of who you're exposed to, and the individuals who you're exposed to. What were they exposed to? and the intensity of the exposure. I think being outside in groups with space is not a problem, largely. Um, I did see one question about the wind. Uh, the wind is actually pretty good because it uh, assures a lot of ventilation. But um, I, by and large, uh, looking around uh, Vancouver and Vancouver uh, area, I think people are doing an excellent job at uh, respecting distancing and respecting you know the, the thing about the masks and there is a lot of controversy as you know in the press about masks and um, certainly a number of jurisdictions uh, when indoors in public spaces uh, people are insisting on masks the science uh, remains a little shaky uh, I personally support that and I do that but I think uh, when people are able to physically distance and respect the other basic principles that Dr. Wright went through, I think we can keep ourselves pretty uh, pretty safe. And I would just remind people that the virus is not going to walk to you. You're going to walk to the virus. So if you stay on your own and don't get too close to people who may be at risk, you're not going to get COVID. Great. Thank you, Dr. Levy and James. Um, that's actually a good segue into our next question regarding social bubbling and expanding our social circle. Can you share a little light on what this might look like for transplant recipients as well as their family members? So um, I can answer that. Uh, so I think the important principle to remember is that when you're in contact with someone, it's actually not just who you're in contact with, it's also everyone that they're in contact with as well. So if you meet a friend, if that, even if you've been um, socially distancing and staying home and, and uh, practicing a lot, that one person that you were meeting uh, could present a higher risk situation if they've been in contact with lots of people and then you go spend a lot of close uh, time with them and are in contact with them. So I think what uh, the idea of bubbles is that you select a certain number of people that you are you want to be in contact with on a regular basis, and then you don't necessarily expand your social circle beyond that, and so that um, you do have some ways of interacting with other people, but you are not exposing yourself in the same way as if you were uh, open to meeting anyone. Excellent, thank you, Dr. Wright. Um, we received a lot of questions um, regarding children. And obviously we, we recognize that we do not have a pediatric specialist on our panel, so we only ask you to answer this to the best of your abilities. But um, regarding children, um, do you have any specific recommendations, particularly around returning to school in the fall, both from the perspective of children who are recipients and from the perspective of families with school-aged children who have transplant, a transplant recipient at home? And perhaps that's a good one for all of you to, to offer some insight, insight on. Don't make me pick on one of you. So um, I, I have talked with uh, Dr. Tom Blind Hansen, who's the head of the pediatric transplant. Um, and I can also speak a little bit to the literature. Again, all of we are all still learning, so there's a lot of gray areas. 
But in general, it seems that for COVID-19, that children are at lower risk of actually acquiring infection. Um, and unlike some other viral infections, they also appear to be at lower risk of transmitting it. And many times the way they are actually acquiring their disease is from contact with adults in their home. So, um, I, and also there are, like Dr. Land mentioned, risk benefits. There are benefits to children going to school or interacting with other people from an educational perspective and from a mental health perspective. And so um, I think there are, everyone is going to have their own boundaries and how risky they feel it is. But in general, it does seem that there are ways to send children to school, which have been done in other areas of the world. And there have not been a great number of increase in cases. Now, most of those areas are places where COVID-19 is not very active. And those countries, for example, have done very intense work and have a lot of rules about the way school is structured and how many interactions. So I think those are things that are occurring in BC. And I know Dr. Blint Hansen said that um, there have been a lot of discussions ongoing and that um, transplant children also seem to be at lower risk and that um, they may actually be considering allowing children who are not highly immunosuppressed to return to school in some form in the fall if they do the other things that children do, like frequent hand hygiene and wear masks. And he mentioned that there will be some email communication going out uh, within the next uh, days to weeks and that uh, he would ask that people talk to their care provider, um, as Kirsty has already mentioned, about specific circumstances or specific questions because there may still be nuances to every individual case. And that goes back to there's just no one right answer at the present time. And there are a lot of factors that go into this and a lot of unknowns, but in general, that, that is the principle thus far. Great, thank you, Dr. Wright. Uh, Dr. Lan, we have a question regarding some of the data that you did present. Can you offer a little bit more insight on how far some of those patients were post-transplant and whether they were stable prior to infection um, and whether newly transplanted patients are also at a higher risk? Thank you. Um, in the patients that have been infected, um, in the data that I've shown, they, they're not recent transplant patients. Um, the, these were um, what we consider more chronic patients. They are not the ones that we transplanted recently. And I think there were some questions around in regards to the patients that did the worst were passed away. They did have multiple comorbidities as well. And we have taken this into consideration when we turn down transplant activity again. And I think so far, all the transplant patients that we've talked to or transplanted recently, they're very good about isolating themselves and following the precautions we've told them to. So um, the ones that unfortunately got infected, they were, they were longer after transplant. They were not even coming to see us all that frequently. They were in a community and they got a community infection. Thank you very much, Dr. Land. And our final question, being mindful of time, um, is regarding masks. Now, I know that that was touched on, but could you offer a little bit more insight on what might be best for transplant patients? We've heard a lot about N95, fabric masks, as well do gloves offer any added protection? Um, yeah, I, I'll take a step with this. Um, there are many unknowns, um, and you can see every jurisdiction is taking a different approach to this. Uh, my advice to transplant patients is probably to do what I do, which is to wear a mask when I'm in public spaces. Uh, it does not have to be an N95 mask. Uh, uh, it can be either a paper uh, surgical mask or a cloth mask. Uh, there are recommendations um, uh, from CDC as to how to make your own mask. Uh, 
a triple layer made of it doesn't really go down to wearing a mask. And then, um, it, it taken on some, uh, uh, it's gotten a lot of people very excited about uh, human rights. Uh, from my perspective, if I can protect people around me and protect myself, um, it, it's a pretty simple thing to do. And remember the major objective of wearing a mask is to prevent you from spreading infection to people around you. And wearing a mask does not mean that you should not be doing the other important things, which are physical distancing, washing your hands, and staying home for your sake. But um, I point to my family and my patients to wear a mask when in other places, and especially when you can't do it. Thank you very much, Dr. Levy. I know you were you were cutting out a little bit there, so I think we may have missed some key parts. I wonder if Alyssa quickly had anything she wanted to follow up on? Yeah, so I would say that um, uh, BCCDC has an excellent description of when to wear a mask. So definitely when you are sick, for example, if you come into the hospital and you're sick, you should be letting people know and putting on a mask if you have respiratory symptoms and that should be a surgical mask. Outside of that, a cloth mask is appropriate and they have recommendations for how to make the cloth masks. There are some industrial N95 masks that are not appropriate and actually put you at higher risk because they have a valve mechanism or they allow your particles to leave. So it defeats the purpose of wearing a mask for COVID. Um, and so there's a couple of don'ts. So if you're wearing a mask, I would, uh, there, I see people who wear them under the nose or under their chin, or they're taking them on and off, and in which case you are probably touching your face and contaminating your hands more often than not. Um, any child under two years of age should not be wearing a mask. Um, and uh, uh, it, and it, like Dr. Levy said at the end, I think, I think most of it came through, but a mask does not replace uh, physical distancing when possible and good hand hygiene. So you shouldn't think that just because you're wearing a mask, you can ignore those other principles. Like he mentioned, it really is to prevent other people from getting sick. So um, I would encourage people to think about them when they are not able to physically distance and to look at the CDC because they have some excellent guidelines on masks. Excellent, thank you so much. And that concludes our question and answer period. So thank you again. Um, we really appreciate everyone's interest as was demonstrated in the quality and the quantity of questions that we received. And we're sorry that we weren't able to get to all of them, but hopefully you found some useful information today. And I will actually hand it back over to Tina for some of her final thoughts. Thanks, Christy. Um, before we close, just want to thank all of our panelists today for taking the time out of their busy schedules to join us and share this information. Uh, thank you to all the attendees attendees for attending this webinar. Uh, we got such a great response. There are a lot of you on here today. So really appreciate you also taking the time and, and listening today. Um, when the webinar is ended, your computer should open to a new page requesting you complete our webinar feedback survey. So you'll also receive a follow up email with the link to the survey if you'd like to complete it later. Your feedback is really important for us to understand what worked well and what we could improve for potential future webinar sessions. So we appreciate you taking a moment to complete it. Uh, you'll also receive a follow-up email within the next few days with a link to view the recording of today's webinar. Um, and so um, you're able to view it later again or share it. Uh, and so on behalf of BC Transplant and the Transplant Research Foundation and our presenters, thank you all for joining us today. Stay well and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.